Good evening. Welcome to Asia Society and welcome to tonight's event, a discussion to mark the publication of In the Camps, China's High Tech Penal Colony. It's a new book about the ongoing campaign of state directed surveillance, repression, incarceration, and violence directed at Uyghurs and other members of religious and ethnic minorities in China's far western region of Xinjiang, and about the technology that facilitates and in some ways has shaped that campaign. I'm Susan Jakes. I'm the editor of China File, which is an online magazine published by Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, China File's senior editor, Jessica Batke. And we're both so pleased to welcome the author of In the Camps, Darren Byler. Darren is an anthropologist and expert on Xinjiang uh, with his first scholarly monograph coming out in just a few months. He's currently an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, and he's been a contributor of groundbreaking reporting and analysis for China File over the past several years. So I know I speak uh, both for myself and for Jessica when I say how honored we are to be hosting the launch of his important and really devastating new book. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing series, China File Presents, and uh, the first installment of this series that we've done online. I'd much rather uh, have had the chance to talk with Darren and Jessica in person, but we have more than 200 of you tuning in with us tonight. Uh, and uh, we wouldn't have had quite as much room for you if uh, we had been in our pre-pandemic bricks and mortar set up in New York. Um, but if this had been uh, an in real life book launch, you'd have had a chance to buy a copy of In the Camps right after we finished talking about it. So I hope I can encourage you to do that virtually by picking your favorite independent online book purveyor. In the Camps is also available on Audible and elsewhere as an audiobook. Uh, anyway, we'll try to remind you of that uh, when we wrap up tonight. We are broadcasting this talk across a number of platforms, but if you're here as a registered participant in the Zoom webinar, you can send questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature. Send those anytime. Uh, and Jessica, Darren, and I will talk for around 45 minutes, and then I'll begin to take your questions. So Darren, the subject of your book is not only the network of detention facilities, camps across Xinjiang, where beginning around 2017, more than a million Uyghurs and members of other minority groups have been forcibly detained uh, in appallingly inhumane conditions, um, but also about the broader systems of control and intimidation that make the whole region into a kind of open air prison. Um, and I think given how difficult it is to grasp the extremity of what's taking place in Xinjiang, one of the things that makes your book so powerful is the way it weaves together uh, the factual and theoretical underpinnings of this larger system with the stories of individual people, uh, ex-detainees, uh, and some of the people who detained them, who are now outside of China and uh, who have spoken to you in great detail about what they went through. I'd like to focus on these individual stories, but first maybe just sketch out for us, how and why did this campaign begin so that we have our bearings a bit? Sure, well, thank you so much uh, for hosting me here. Uh, it's a real honor. Um, and you know, this book has been in the long process. Um, you know, I started 10 years ago doing research in this region, um, and then I've spent the last several years really thinking about this, this book and how to present it. Um, and, you know, really the origins of what's happened to uh, the people that were detained is, you have to go back to around 2014, which is when the People's War on Terror was declared. That was in response to violent incidents that happened in the Uyghur region, but in other parts of China as well. Um, you know, incidents where Uyghur civilians attacked Han civilians in public spaces, like a, a train station in Kunming and uh, Tiananmen Square, the, the center of political power in China. 
Um, those incidents really, I think, set off a, a number of alarms uh, across the country, both among the general public and the, the party elite. Um, and, and that's when they really began this campaign of, of um, assessing the population and, and initially detaining community leaders, people that have been teaching Islam uh, in Uyghur villages. Um, there was a lot of thinking that if people are religious in their practice, that that you know that they're they're practicing in a in a way that's public and that um, is really conforming to normative forms of Islam in other places, where they're praying five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, those sorts of things, that that could lead to um, to terrorism. They called that kind of behavior extremism. Um, so it was this conflation between religious behavior and uh, and violent action that led eventually to this mass internment of so many people. Um, but it took some time for them to, to really, you know, be able to assess who is doing this extremist stuff, who is, who is fasting, who is praying five times a day or praying in their own homes, which is also, according to these new regulations, something that's now um, forbidden. And the way that they did that assessment was through a lot of human intelligence. They hired lots of people, but they also developed uh, new tech technological assessment tools that could go through people's digital history and see what they've been doing online, what they've been doing on social media and where they had been traveling, what their social network looked like, if they had relatives living abroad in places like Turkey or, or Egypt. Um, and so it took some time for them to really, you know, turn up the pressure and, and, and then actually begin to detain people at, at the level of the population. Um, and so that, you know, didn't really arrive until 2017. And, um, you know, when I was starting thinking about this and thinking about the people's war on terror, I didn't anticipate that there would be mass detentions at this scale. And they might not have either. They might not have known that they would actually detect so many people that were, according to these new counterterrorism laws, which were implemented, so many people um, should be detained as, as having committed you know, terrorism and extremism crimes that are not serious, um, but could lead to something more. And the not serious is actually how they, they describe these, these crimes. I mean, the, the phenomenon of counterterrorism has a pretty uh, checkered history, not, not only in China, but also uh, around the world and right here in the U.S. Jessica, you, you have been also following um, events in Xinjiang, uh, quite closely, both during your years in government and in the years since you've come to China file. How do you understand how um, the Chinese leadership's conception of and practice of counterterrorism differs from that of other countries? That's a really good question. And I, I should preface by saying I'm not an expert in uh, counterterrorism elsewhere. So um, I don't want anything I say to be construed as uh, making counterterrorism here sound too sunny or fair, because I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, but I think one of the key things is what Darren mentioned, which is um, this idea of not serious activities, activities which are very um, normal parts of everyday practice being conflated with pre-crime, as I think Darren calls it in his book, right, or pre-terrorism. Um, and that obviously can help it happen elsewhere as well, but um, it is so in this case tied to specific ethnicities of people. Um, and to people who have been in this place, like this is their homeland, right? This is where this culture has developed. And so um, it, there is a government which has come in and said, I know you've been doing this for a really long time, but now we've decided that this is terrorism. Um, I don't, again, I don't wanna say that's never happened anywhere else, but um, just from my rough understanding of what's going on in the US, that strikes me slightly different. Darren, anything you, you wanna add to that? What about the scale? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. What Jessica is pointing out is that eth ethnicity is an important sort of variable in this system because there, there is other uh, Muslims in China that were not targeted in the same way. Uyghurs and maybe to some extent Kazakhs were seen as less assimilated, and that really has to do with their their ethnicity, their racial difference, um, and also their their language practice. So they they speak. Kazakh or Uyghur is their first language, and they, they have attachments to the lands in which they live as their ancestral homelands. Um, so, you know, all of that means that 
that they're seen as more of a threat to sort of social stability to the, the state. The other thing, like like you mentioned, is the the scale is quite different. So in the U.S. and in Europe, there's programs called Countering Violent Extremism or Prevent in, in the U.K., which is meant to stop people from being radicalized. And this really sort of rose to the fore, you know, in the 2010s. Um, and, and, and in response to things like the Islamic State, where people wanted to prevent uh, young Muslims from being radicalized. And so they mobilized imams and other community leaders and also school teachers and, and, and others to report on, on suspicious activities that they saw in the Muslim community. The policing theory literature that I've read from China says that you know, they think that they're doing something similar, that they're preventing Uyghurs from being radicalized by sort of nipping it in the bud. That's the, the term that they use. Um, the problems are that they're using these technology tools that you know have that have been developed not from within the community, but by you know computer scientists, by people that are are looking for 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 markers, um, and are very broad. And in addition, they're they're the 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 human technicians the people that are employing these systems at least in positions of power are are not from the community and so i think they don't really understand what they're looking at you know in terms of what is actually radical or not um so it's these factors combined the ethnic difference language difference um not really understanding what you're looking at and then projecting it onto this entire population that makes the scale of it so much larger um and really produces something that's more about transforming the entire population rather than targeting people that you think are suspicious. One phrase that you use a lot in, in, in that context of this just very broad targeting um, and that appears often in the book and I think uh, is particularly hard to grasp in the abstract is the term digital enclosure. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, that that term, and maybe in the context of one of the um, central figures in the book, uh, a, a young University of Washington student um, who's who's uh, you came to know and whose story you tell. Sure. So the term digital in- enclosure is not my own. It comes from a, a communication scholar named Mark Andreevich, and what he's talking about is is uh, the way all of us are in digital enclosures at this point. You know, if we own a smartphone um, or even if we don't, when we move through the world, we're being tracked in some ways. Um, And so, um, you know, most of this is by, by, uh, you know, uh, by technology platforms like Facebook or whatever apps you have on your phone um, or your your internet provider. or it's by the state as you, you know, travel through space, like your car will be detected and, and, and so on. So in that sense, you know, social behavior itself has been captured and is enclosed. The enclosure that Mark Andreevich is talking about is the way that things that previously were outside of the market, that were outside of um, governance in some ways, that were, you know, the, the commons of our lives, um, the private spaces of our lives, our social relations, those things have now become data that um, can be fed into the technology systems and governance systems. In Xinjiang, that is amplified to an extreme degree. They're using social media data. They're collecting GPS tracking information as people move through space on their phones, in their cars, all of that. Um, But they've also now built out a grid network of checkpoints throughout the entire region. And so as people move through space, um, they encounter these checkpoints. And, and Vera Jo, who's this University of Washington student, spent quite a lot of time with, with her and her mother over the last several years. So I was at the University of Washington teaching you know, when she was taken. Um, what she told me as she, after she was able to come back is that you know, there were moments after she had been released from the camp and was, was being sort of on probation, sort of in, under house arrest, as she would walk through space, um, she would encounter police officers who would, would pull her to the side and then take her into a surveillance hub and say, you've been flagged by the system. And she would see her face 
on the, the screen with a, a square around it. Um, and it, there was an indication that she wasn't, so there's green squares and there's orange squares and there's red squares. It depends a bit on, 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 on which system is being used. But in this case, she had an orange square, I, I think around her face that indicated that she was uh, someone who was on the watch list, on a watch list. Um, and so she wasn't su supposed to be in the area where she was. Um, it was outside of the grid that was allotted to her. Um, so in that sense, the digital enclosure now begins to work as a kind of uh, controlling device that, that prevents people from moving through space, but only certain people. And so there's a sort of digital apartheid system where you know, some people who are on the green list are able to walk freely, whereas the, the people on, the, on these watch lists um, are pulled to the side. Um, and you know, this is happening just through facial recognition. Then of course, there's these hard checkpoints where you have your face scanned and your ID scanned and all of that. Um, and Vera, because she's Hui and could pass as Han would sometimes just go through the, the back gate or the green lane of the checkpoint um, and pretend to be Han rather than you know, knowing that she's Muslim and should have her ID checked. And so that works sometimes, but not always. And so over time, she just started to say, you know, I should stay home. I shouldn't connect with anyone um, on WeChat or in other ways because they could be implicated with their, through their association with me. Um, and so it really began to constrain her social relations. She said the main thing she did on, in terms of her digital self was just retweet or you know, repost um, the things that her probation officer, the, the, the person who works in the civil affairs ministry who was assigned to her, um, what that person posted on their WeChat wall, she just you know, amplified it to show that she was loyal and that she was committed to um, her rehabilitation, her, her transformation through, through this re-education regime. One, one of the, I mean, one of the parts of the book that was so striking was the story of what happened to her before the period that you're um, talking about. Uh, when she she was detained uh, and and brought to um, a reeducation facility, and you know one of the things that struck me so forcefully when I was reading the book, um, and this is really a question for uh, for both of you, so I'll let both of you respond, is just how brutally cruel psychologically and and physically violent the reeducation centers were. Um, from the descriptions of the former detainees that you uh, spoke to, you know, several of them, I can't remember if Vera was one of these described unremitting forms of, uh, of physical torture um, uh, affecting people who had been um, locked up for nothing more than using a VPN or watching a Turkish television show or traveling abroad um, and then found themselves uh, packed into tiny cells with dozens of other people, in some cases, no toilets, just open buckets of sewage. The lights are on all the time. Uh, they're made to watch one another as they sleep, even as the guards are watching them through surveillance cameras in their cells. Um, they describe not being able to move for long stretches of time to the point where they begin to experience serious um, medical consequences, intestinal prolapse, and just horrific uh, bodily harm. They're rarely allowed to shower. Women are drugged to stop them from menstruating. Um, people are beaten for, uh, for moving, for whispering to one another, um, for crying. Um, they're severely undernourished. In some cases, they're actively tortured using machines designed for that torture. And one, one of your sources describes, you know, hearing the sounds of that as she was taking her uh, break from teaching in one of these centers every day. It's just so uh, punitive. Um, and yet Chinese leaders, both internally and externally, describe what's taking place as a form of de-radicalization. As you, as you said, they, they often speak of it using the language of public health. They're, you know, curing uh, or immunizing against um, a diseased ideology. And I just realized I, I really struggle to understand how these two pieces fit together. Like, why not either let the people leave the country or on the flip side, if they're seen as so dangerous and and so criminal as to merit this kind of abuse, um, 
why not just the punishment? Why also the, the education? How do you, how do you understand that? Jessica, Darren? Darren, you should go first. Okay. Um, well, I mean, one of the things that Gozira, um, I'm sorry, um, Kalbanur uh, Siddiq, the, the camp worker that you mentioned, um, what she's talking about uh, is the way that people that were in management of the camp told her that like, you know, this is not a hotel, this is a camp. <laughs> that they were very clear that there should be overcrowding, that people should be in physical discomfort and pain um, those, you know, that was part of the goal of sort of breaking their spirit, forcing them to submit. Um, in some ways, I think maybe when from a central management level or position, um, they maybe were surprised at how many people they detained initially. And, you know, most people were held in initially in sort of warehouses and government offices that were not designed to hold people at all, which is why there's buckets being used as toilets um, and, you know, showers are just a once a week or once a month or what have you. Um, over time, I think conditions did get somewhat better in terms of sanitation and, and things like that. Um, Another element of this, and, and we hear this in relation to, to sexual violence in, in some camps, um, is that you know some things were being done off camera, uh, which means that the the local the guards and, and management that are in the camp, you know, are are doing things to these detainees that aren't mandated. I mean, if they're doing it off camera, there's a reason for that. Now, some of it might have been because they were they were um, in some cases taking money, or it seems. Uh, from visitors who wanted to to have uh, you know, to have sex with these women in the camp, um, but in other cases they also talk about trying to hide the bruising by you know hitting them in the head and, and the, it, 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 because it, the bruises won't show through their hair, and that sort of you know that indicates that they're also that there's some disconnect I think between the local brutality inside a camp and management higher up the chain. At the same time, a camp itself is outside the law. It's outside of sort of you know, moral, you know, outside of, of legal control. And so it, it rests instead on the moral authority of the, the people that are running the camp, um, you know, their moral authority and, and capacity, their, their moral compass. Um, and, you know, when people have absolute power in that kind of system, um, Things often tend in this direction, I think. And there's incentives, I think, to show your cruelty, especially for, for Uyghur and Kazakh guards, um, because they need to show how loyal they are. But it, what, what do you think, Jessica? Is that? Yeah, sort of no, I, what do you think? I, I agree with all of that. I think it's also important to think about what are the long term goals of this campaign, right? And, and part of that is to stop generational cultural transmission, to get people to control their own behavior, or may, maybe even like, you know, for younger people to not even think in the, in the extremist ways that previous generations had, right? And the goal is not necessarily to keep everyone locked up forever. It is to instill absolute fear and loyalty so that people will behave themselves. And this is abetted by the fact that they never know when they're being watched and when they're not being watched, right? Like you will always behave if you think that any point in your day, no matter where you are, you could be monitored. Um, I thought one of the vignettes that struck me so forcefully um, from the book was when someone was coming, they were finally allowed to see their family member who was in a camp. And um, <laughs> The family members had to say they knew they, that everything was OK, like they were all good. And they knew that, you know, the person in the camp was being treated well. And the person in the camp had to say, yes, they're treating me well and everything's good. And like the family knew that was false. The detainee knew that was false. The guard who was watching this and who told the, the, the detainee to say that also knew it was false. And I couldn't I couldn't think of a reason for this bizarre play acting where everyone knows a thing is false and we all have to say it out loud anyway, other than like instilling the absolute like bodily absolute loyalty to the state or absolute obedience to the state. I, I couldn't come up with another reason because I just thought it was so bizarre. But I wanted to ask the question, Susie, I mean, if it's I can. not bizarre in the in the context of 
authoritarian political system, sure right? yeah that, that it was a striking of... yeah where everyone involved all sides of it knew it's not real <laughs> but yes it's not it's i guess it's not bizarre in that way um if i can ask a question yeah, of course uh this kind of goes it, it's goes back to some of the things you were talking about earlier darren but also you know you mentioned you think they were surprised at the beginning about how many people they detained um and i i also i'm also just wondering about like you know the criteria that they're using for detaining people, right? We've talked a lot about those um, and how uh, overly broad and arbitrary they are. And I'm just wondering, like, if you can talk a little bit about how that arbitrariness can be masked at times by the use of technology, right? If it's like, oh, the like this very fancy machine with all this data says this person is an extremist and therefore we must arrest them. And it it, it can mask a lot of the fact that there's a human on the back end of that, like setting what the what the you know the sliders are for what gets set. Um, you talk a lot about that in the book, and I think that's a really um, important point. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more how that, I don't know if that played into how many people were initially detained that they were surprised by, or just any thoughts you have. Yeah. I mean, once the system is set in motion and there are, are so many incentives to detain as many people as possible in order to sort of prove your loyalty or your commitment to the campaign, you know, at the local level, proving to people higher in command, um, that's, I think, when you really get these really Im immense numbers. Um, and technology is used to assist that, for sure. Um, so some of the former detainees I, I spoke with said they still don't know why they were detained, and no one could tell them why they were detained. They said, you know why you're detained. You wouldn't be here if you, don't, if you weren't supposed to be. Um, and, and there's also an in interrogation I heard from numerous former detainees and incentives to, to profess your guilt, even if you don't even if you aren't guilty um, of the thing they say you are, because if you say you're innocent, you're not, you're not portraying a good attitude, which means that you'll be beaten more harshly. You know, the guilt is sort of presumed um, as soon as the person is deemed untrustworthy. It's, it's very difficult, I found, in most cases, for people to get off the list if they've been de determined to be untrustworthy. Um, you know, only with in the beginning, if you had some government connections or some potentially money, you could get out of it. Um, but in general, that wasn't the case. So I think the authority of the technology really determined at least that, that initial investigation. And then almost in all cases, the investigation, you know, comes back with a verdict of guilty. Um, one of the, the things that people are also up against is being sent to prison instead of uh, the camp. And so there's sort of a plea bargaining that's happening where, you know, camp is seen as an, as a lesser charge. Um, and, and it is, you know, you'll get out more quickly. Um, and so, you know, people I think are willing to accept whatever the, whatever the, the police are telling them they've been guilty of um, pretty readily. There's, they really have no choice. You, you cite the statistic that something like half a million um, people were also criminally prosecuted in Xinjiang between, I think, 2017 and 2020, and that that's a rate of criminal prosecution that's many times, is it six times, six times higher than the national average. Do you have a, do we have any sense of, um, of, uh, what those cases look like? Are they available? Um, who who was getting prosecuted that way? And and and, um, and where are I mean? Are all those people in prison, or did did some of them also wind up in these camps? So many of those people were initially in the camps, um, and then you know after they were there for a year or more. Um, were then criminally prosecuted. That, that's my sense of it. Although we know that you know something like two hundred thousand or so people were were sentenced in the first two years of the campaign, twenty seventeen and eighteen, and then after that they stopped actually listing. And by twenty nineteen, they stopped listing the the sentencing data, but they still include the the, the numbers prosecuted. And you know, if someone is prosecuted formally in China, there's a ninety nine percent of being convicted. So we have a pretty good sense that those 533,000 people that were prosecuted were found guilty. And we don't know for sure that all of them were 
you know, associated only with the, the re-education camps or were Muslims, but still it gives us a sense of just rates of prosecution. Many of the people that were sent to prison were people that were, I think, deemed un, still untrustworthy, not re-educated. Maybe they didn't pass language and ideology exams. Um, in some cases, it may have been that they were not deemed sort of a good fit for, for labor, because many of the former detainees have been sent to work in factories. Um, it could be that they're, they're seen as, as uh, more tightly connected to extremism and, and those sorts of things. And so it's difficult, more difficult for them to be rehabilitated. But we've seen cases of entire families that have been sen- sentenced um, you know, for having a relative that, or it appears, for having a relative living in Turkey, um, for giving money to those relatives living in Turkey, which, you know, is said to be supporting terrorism, um, those sorts of things. We, you know, many religious leaders in these communities have also been sentenced. Um, so uh, those are the kinds of, of people we see um, being sentenced, those that were, 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 whose crimes were, I think, more serious. Part of what's happening here is it's just so difficult to prosecute everyone when you've detained so many people all at the same time. The prosecutors were just overloaded. And so I think that's maybe why it took so, so much time to move them from the camps and detention centers into prisons. And they had to build the prisons too. So You touched on this just briefly, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how coerced labor uh, fits into this uh, picture that you're painting for us. Um, who benefits from it? I mean, we know... Um, the Chinese Communist Party has a long tradition of um, reform through labor and that the PRC has a long history, both of this idea that a person's beliefs can be um, uh, beneficially altered through hard labor um, and about an equally long history of the forced labor of prisoners uh, benefiting the state in various ways or, or, or um, uh, cronies of the state uh, in material ways. Um, is this just more of that same pattern or is there um, a, a different dynamic at play with the use of um, uh, incarcerated or, or detained people in, in forced labor? So, you know, in 2018, the development uh, Develop, Economic Development Affairs Commission, I'm butchering the name, but that's something like that, of, of the Uyghur region, um, said that the camps had become a carrier of the economy um, because they and were attracting so many new companies from other parts of China. Now, many of these companies uh, came as part of pairing assistance programs. So localities across eastern China have sort of adopted counties or cities in Xinjiang as their sister city or sister county, and they've developed um, factories and industrial parks associated with them. Um, So there's some indication that there's this mechanism that's built into the camps and the factories uh, where there's kind of a pipeline from the camps to the factories. Um, There's subsidies for people, for the companies to relocate. and there's assurances that the workers will be compliant. They're told, at least in some cases, very directly that if they don't work as they're told, they'll be sent back to the camp. Um, so there's um, that dynamic that's in play. In some cases, the camps and the factories are in the same location. In other cases, they're um, nearby. Um, so you know that's one track of labor. There's another track of labor that's going on at the same time, which is a, is turning farmers and uh, herders into factory workers, people that were not ever detained in the camps, but were deemed surplus laborers because they you know, don't have a, 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 an employer and didn't have an, a, a substantial enough income um, and are of certain age. Um, and those people are also graded and, and, and there's a, an actual a point system that they use to decide who is a secure laborer. Um, and that, that those laborers can be sent to Eastern China um, and who is a is sort of normal labor? Those are sent to to factories that are in the in the Xinjiang region, and then there's the untrustworthy laborers um, who are sent to training. And one one track of training is the camps. Um, so really, what we're seeing is a, a sort of 
population-wide proletarianization, which is like a Marxist term for, for turning people that are doing agricultural work or, or non-industrial work into industrial workers and really integrating them into the wage economy, um, which is the Chinese marketplace. And so I think you know, removing people from the land and placing them in the factory is another way of sort of instilling a, a form of power and control over the population and also um, a sort of forcible integration. So that seems to be one of the, one of the, the, the things that is motivating this. Do you want to add anything, Jessica? I can see if you were. No, I don't need to add anything. I'm, okay. I'm good. In that case, Darren, I realize that I have an, another question a little bit unrelated to the book. It, it occurs to me that, um, uh, you know, I've known you for several years. I don't know much about um, how you embarked with your on your relationship with Xinjiang as a scholar. Um, I'm sure a book like the, the one that you've just written probably wasn't what you had in mind at the time, but I'd, I'd love to just hear a little bit about how how you came to how you came to Xinjiang? Well, it was a long time ago. I, I went there for the first time in 2003 when I was an undergraduate student. Um, I had been studying photojournalism um, and was really interested in seeing the world. I grew up in Ohio, which seems about as far away from Xinjiang as you can get. Um, and I, you know, that's then that was my goal really to kind of get as far away as I could from what I from the places I had grown up in. Um, and, you know, as a photographer, Xinjiang was a place that was really interesting um, in terms of sort of social life that happens in public. Um, this is this vibrant bizarre culture, um, landscapes in these vernacular cities that are, you know, have been built over centuries. Um, the architecture is the vernacular part of it. It's, it's built in the style of courtyard houses with little winding alleyways and things like that. Um, so, you know, initially that's what drew me to it is like this place seems really interesting, very different from what I understood. And, and, and I was also really interested in the way that these um, traders and, and craftspeople in this space were carrying forward traditions that seemed really old in some ways. They were still making a lot of things by hand. Um, so it seemed like an intact culture in some ways. And, you know, eventually I became an anthropologist and, and that interest in culture and how uh, humans sustain themselves, how they um, bring, you know, indigenous or uh, local traditions into the present. Um, that's really what first attracted me to the Uyghurs. I could see also at the same time as all of, I was seeing all of that, you know, maybe not initially, but over time, that the great, the, the open up the West campaign, uh, which was China's development initiative that would go into Northwest China, that, that was going to radically transform this space. I could see already infrastructure being built, you know, rail, railroads and, and development in the space. And so, um, you know, as I developed my project, it became about um, how this space is being transformed by this new economic presence of, of people that were moving in um, and all of this new development of, of the resources. I didn't anticipate, you know, that there would be camps in that story. Um, initially, I was interested in the digital infrastructure that was being built and how that was transforming Uyghur life. The way WeChat allowed them to connect with each other, find jobs, move to the city and connect with the broader world. Um, but then over time, it became a story about surveillance and how you know, that digital activity would be used to you know, put these people in, in, in camps. Talk a little bit about your last couple of research trips to, to Xinjiang. I mean, you must, must have had a lot of people as, a, as an anthropologist that you got to know um, really well through your field work and friends. And um, what, what has it been like uh, doing research maybe over the past, well, you, you picked the period, but uh, <laughs> I guess you were last there in 2018. Is that right? That's right. So I was, you know, I did most of my field work in 2014 and 15, which is when the People's War on Terror began. And so most of my relationships were built then. Um, and I was mostly spending time with, with Uyghur male migrants to the city. Uh, so I had, you know, all of these friends from across the region who had moved to Arunchi. Um And initially that's 
you know, what I was studying is how they survive in the city, how they protect themselves, um, and how the police and other forces in the city tries to control them. Um, so that was a central tension in, in, in the initial uh, research. In 2018, when I came back, I, I really couldn't connect with those people because many of them had been taken to the camps. Um, not, I don't think necessarily because of their contact with me several years before, um, but because they had, you know, they had been involved in religious activities. Most of my contacts back in 2014 and 15 um, were going to the mosque, were using WeChat to talk about the Quran and things like that. All these things that would later be outlawed. Um, so in 2018, I couldn't really contact them. Instead, I, I really went to these checkpoints and observed what what happens in the checkpoints. Um, I tried to travel in in ways where the migrants that I'd known would have traveled, which was mostly the buses, um, because a lot of the the controls are happening in those spaces rather than in airplanes or in in, in other more uh, sort of affluent ways of traveling. Um, so, you know, I was observing all of these checkpoints, the grid system they had hired or were in the process of hiring you know, 60,000 new grid workers and tens of thousands more police. And so I was stopped often by these grid workers, asked for my documents um, and had some conversations with them. Um, so, you know, all of that gave me the a grid feeling is a for policing it. system, right? Not a, an, an electricity carrying system as we would think of it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the grid is, is a policing grid and there's uh, p convenience police stations, which is how they're called, people's convenience police stations every two to 300 meters. And, and these grid workers, which are these low level police, assistant police is what they're called. Um, they're the ones that, that conduct the checks around um, the, the surveillance hubs and also these you know, physical uh, checkpoints. Um, so that's what I was looking for. It was how does this grid system work? Then in 2020, I went to Kazakhstan and interviewed around 40 people, um, most of whom had come across the border recently. And, and you know, there's maybe 15 or so detainees that I interviewed at that time, former detainees. Um, and those stories really became the majority of the narratives that are in the book, um, the stories of those what those people told me. But because I had spent time in the grids and seen what kind of life they had been through, I could ask them very specific questions about the things I had observed in the years before. Um, so I think that brings a, a different level of detail to the stories that, that the former detainees um, could, could tell me. Um, the other thing I should mention is I've also been looking at tens of thousands of internal police documents that were obtained by the intercept um, that are very granular in level, you know, in, in terms of the detail. Um, and it's reports written by these grid workers, the low level police, um, and also the, the civil affairs ministry people that decide who should go to the camps. Um, so that you know also figures into how I understand the sort of physics of the system. Um, and of course, I've been working with with Jessica on the surveillance uh, uh, documents that she's gotten too, which are amazing in terms of showing the capacities of the systems. I'm going to jump in with a question. Um, this is a little bit a field from what, what Susie just asked, but it's something um, that really struck me that seemed to appear in multiple places implicitly in the book was the this idea of the partial invisibility of the Uyghur or other other ethnic minorities' experiences in terms of like from the Han majority perspective, right? So, you know, there's a couple places where, you know, you mentioned that, you um, for example, when Vera was being, I think it was Vera, when she was being put into a police car, she had a Han boyfriend. And so she was treated much better when he could see. And then once he couldn't see her anymore, how they actually physically treated her changed. Um, and there's quotes from people who are like, you know, from people who are saying, well, there's a lot of Han migrants who didn't really know anything. So they figured they must, you know, there must be terrorists everywhere if they're detaining all these people, right? Um, and at the same time, you know, there's instances you're just describing, um, I think there was someone on a bus and there was young, young Han teenagers that were yelling at them, why are you here? Why haven't you been sent away yet? So there's still, there, there's this tension of a partial invisibility of, of this experience. And also, you know, that, that some Han people still have the power, even though they can't see everything to send these people away. 
Um, I'm just wondering how you assess, you know, how, how some of these Han people living in Xinjiang, like view what's going on and how that does or doesn't affect the policies that are happening um, in China. I think a lot of Han people have a, a, a very a partial view of the camp system and it's really sort of limited to their own experience. Um, you know, many have been assigned to work as relatives or, or you know, to, to go and visit adopt a Uyghur or Kazakh family and live in their home and, and, and then write reports about what they see. Um, and that's seen as like a, a real inconvenience. Um, but I don't know that many of them fully understand what their, what their reports will do to those people, um, you know, what the camp conditions are really like. It's hard to know for sure, because sometimes when you talk, when I talk to people in 2018, um, I interviewed a, a number of those people. Um, they would give me a range of views. Like someone would say that, oh, it is kind of a school. Um, of course, they're being punished, but it is sort of a school. Um, then others would say it's going to be really difficult because they've been torn apart from their families and stuff. Um, so they acknowledged those aspects of it. But I don't know if they knew exactly how or if, like how horrific um, conditions in the camp were. That you know these people are shackled and have hoods put over their heads. Uh, um, and are treated in really inhumane ways. Of course, there's many people that actually work in the camps and, and I think have a very full view of what's going on. Um, but it's hard to know, you know, how that breaks down across the entire population. The people that actually live in the region that are from that region, the people that are see themselves as local to Xinjiang and, you know, Uyghur food is really their food. Um, you know, those people, Han people, they see what's happening as, as something that's that's, I think, a, a pretty dramatic overreach um, because I think they understand that Uyghurs are not terrorists in general. Um, they've lived with them for decades and it's been fine. Um, so I, I think there is sort of that knowledge gap when it comes to, you know, how, how long has that person been in the region? Who do they know? What have they seen? There's so much gaslighting in the, in the media that I think it's really hard for people to know you know, what they're hearing from Chinese state media, um, you know, what is the truth about this system? That's a nice uh, lead into another question that I had uh, for both of you. And it looks like actually somebody from the audience had the same, um, same question. So good audience. Um, the Associated Press just published a story, I think yesterday, uh, reporting that some of the most visible signs of control in, in Xinjiang, particularly um, the technological ones, have disappeared from the streets of uh, Xinjiang's larger cities. The surveillance cameras are being taken down. Um, of course, China's government announced at the end of 2019 that everyone who needed re-education had already been fully re-educated uh, and that the camps um, were uh, closed. Obviously, these two pieces of information come from very, very different kinds of sources, a very good associated report, uh, press reporter on the one hand and um, maybe a, a slightly more uh, unreliable narrative on, on the other side. Um, but the uh, reporter, Dick Kang, writes that the panic that had gripped the region a few years ago um, has subsided considerably and that there's a sense of normality creeping back in. Um, I want to ask both of you, what, what do you make of this? How do you understand what's, what, what is happening now? Jessica, you <laughs> want to start and then... <laughs> I was going to let Darren start his oh. book. <laughs> Go ahead, okay. Darren. All right. Um, well, you know, I've, I've talked to Dake, the, the author of that um, Associated Press piece, many times, um, including after his recent trip. Um, and during that same trip, he went to um, what is now called the number three jail, Kanshuo which is in Dabanchong, it's the largest camp that there was. Um, and what he saw there was that the, just basically the name had been changed from camp or re-education center to jail. Um, and he you know, went inside and, and saw the cells um, that you know, in the past were the camp cells and are now jail cells. Um, so really what's happening is a shift, I think, from internment to imprisonment. 
Um, so there's, you know, a sort of warehousing of these people that formerly were in the camps and maybe had some potential of being released um, and are now being held inside the prisons. Um, and, you know, and they would say this too, that, that the, the surveillance equipment that's being taken down is, is in urban areas and is in places where international visitors travel more frequently. Um, and so I think, you know, if it's intentionally being taken down, which we see like cameras being ripped out of the wall, basically or off the poles with the wire still there, um, that I think is, you know, because there, there's a, some narrative control that the state is really wanting to do. In other parts of Xinjiang, especially Northern Xinjiang, there's also now you know, checkpoints that are no longer really being used um, where the equipment isn't really functional. Um, and it seems as though that's because both there's not funding to keep it functional and also there's not political will. Um, and they don't really see the urgency in having those checkpoints there anymore. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what is motivating these changes. I think in international pressure is, is a major factor though, and it shouldn't be discounted. Um, part of it, I think, is that maybe they feel like the systems have accomplished what they wanted them to do, which is terrify the entire population um, and you know, transform them to, to put them to work in these factories without any forms of resistance. I don't, does that sound right to you, Jessica? Yeah, I, I really worry that you know, um, some of this dismantling that we're seeing or the, you know, the outward signs of a return to normalcy are, are manifestations of the fact that the government thinks it's, it's successfully executed parts of this campaign, right? And the important part is that even when people are out, they're not in camps, um, they're out on the street, they are still being watched. Even though those cameras have been ripped off the poles, <clears throat> everybody carries a tracking device with them all the time, right? And, um, people can be questioned. Why don't you have a smartphone, right? So, so there are still ways of monitoring people. Everyone knows that. Uh, people are still, you know, Uyghurs in the diaspora are still cut off from their family members. Even if their family members are out of the camps, they're not talking to them. So, um, you know, my concern is that um, this outward sign of normality can help mask the fact that a lot of these people are still really unfree in, in important ways um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's quite canny if you're the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So it, do you, do you see this as, what, what do you, how do you understand, um, how China's leaders see the end game of this process? What is it going to, I mean, the 1.5 million people, and if you include the 500,000 kids that are in, you know, have been, are in, um, what do you call them? Well, jail orphanages, uh, but children who have been separated from their parents. You're talking about roughly or more than 10% of the whole ethnic minority population of Xinjiang, right? Or is the expectation that this is just, this is just something that has now reached a stage where it can continue? Uh, I mean, has it, you, do, you, do you think it's reached a kind of a, a, a stasis or what might we expect next? I realize that's a hard question. Yeah. I mean, when, what the, government says that they're doing is that they're attempting to uh, create long-term stability, that it's, it's a, a solution to the Xinjiang problem. Um, and so that, you know, they need to you know, have firm resolve in, in accomplishing this, this mission. Um, and I, you know, I don't know exactly what that means. It's quite big, but I think in general, it means that this is a, a long process that should be thought of as like at a generational scale. Um, and so I think they really feel like the children who are in these residential boarding schools, and there's a whole range of them from kindness centers for the children, the, the, the toddlers to, you know, formal schools, they've hired 90,000 new teachers, um, who have, who are politically loyal, many from outside of the Uyghur region who are you know, non-Muslims to teach in these schools. Um, I think they feel like that educational aspect of it, the residential schools, that is really what will produce a new generation of, of Uyghurs and Kazakhs who will have a lot less loyalty to their identity, who will perhaps see their identity as lacking in some ways. 
Um, of course, we know from other sort of colonial experiments that residential schools don't often accomplish what they are intended to do. Um, and said they traumatize entire populations. Um, and so I think what we'll see going forward is, you know, trauma playing out um, throughout the entire population of, of the, you know, the of Uyghur society and Kazakh society. The factory separation aspects of, of the system where they're s- sending farmers and herders to other parts of China, other parts of Xinjiang, um, so, you know, separating them from their children. That's, you know, a, a process of fragmenting the basic social units, the families themselves, which is you know, the source of social reproduction, the future of the society. Um, and so I think that's, you know, in the long term, along with the family planning rules and all of that is really what's going to diminish the vitality of, of Uyghur and Kazakh society going forward. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree that this is, this is something that I, I think the leadership is thinking about in generational terms. Um, and it's the goal is not to stop, say, Uyghurs from being, it's to stop Uyghurs from being Uyghur in all the ways that the Chinese government has determined that to be problematic. Um, and, you know, while these boarding schools are absolutely going to traumatize people and, and everything that's happening right now is going to traumatize people, um, you know, I, I, they are keeping these children from speaking Uyghur, right? A lot of these kids may grow up not being able to speak it. I mean, they, they, there are ways that they're managing to cut off that cultural transmission through this. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know where we go next from here, but I do think it is a, it's a, it's a generational scale, time scale where they're working on. Maybe just um, one more question from me and then we can start taking some um, from the audience. But I, I just wanted to turn to the, the final section of the book, Jaren, um, where um, you write at length about the role of technology, um, AI, many kinds of technology developed uh, outside of China for, you know, if not perfectly benign, then at least far less um, overtly abusive purposes. Um, than the ones that they're being uh, used for in Xinjiang, um, you know, that are then fairly easily transmuted in, into um, instruments of uh, repression in the context of Xinjiang. Um, some of the same kinds of, of uh, biometric scanning devices and software being used to combat COVID have have had far more sinister applications in Xinjiang. And so I just, I wonder um, in ending the book that way, do, do, you, do you see this as a cautionary tale about technology per se, uh, or more about uh, something else, the dangers of letting it fall into the wrong hands or uh, explain your view of uh, mm-hmm. technology? Uh-huh. I mean, some of what I was doing was thinking in terms of the narrative of the book. I start in Seattle with Vera Jo coming from the University of Washington, and I end in Seattle with you know, companies that are coming from Seattle and back to China. Um, and that there's you know a central player, which is the University of Washington in that story, and also Microsoft and others. Um, so that was sort of what I was thinking. It's, just, it's just supposed to be about a global issue and I wanted to draw out those connections. I think this is a story about technology and about the role of surveillance in the world. Um, in the West, you know, we're in the digital enclosure as well. Um, we've mostly consented to be in it um, by saying yes to Facebook and Twitter and all the other apps we have on our phones. Um, And so as a consumer um, and as someone who is protected in terms of our citizenship status for most of us, um, that's maybe concerning that that our phones know so much about us, these companies know so much about us, um, but it's a choice that we've made and and our situation is not dire. Um, For people that are in less protected situations like the Uyghurs, for instance, and other, you know, stateless populations. So just, you know, you know, asylum seekers at the southern border of the U.S. are also in a similar sort of position where their social media can be used against them to track their social network and control them. Um, you know, for them, it's it's not just a, a choice. It's 
it's about you know the future of their lives themselves um and so i think you know we should think about the moral implications of building such tools that have this differential effect on people that are less protected and what i'd like to see technologists um you know and people thinking about ethics and politics you know advocate a bit more forcefully is uh, you know tools that are designed in a way that protect the people that are most vulnerable um, so that, you know that's what I hope people get out of the book the other thing I want to point out is just how normal these technologies are that you know we use them all the time or we've experienced them in many ways when you go through the you know the the customs at the airport like you have your face scanned, you have your biometrics taken, um, all the same tools that are being used dozens of times a day in Xinjiang. And it's, the difference is really the scale and the protections of the people that are, are being assessed by those, those tools. Um, so, you know, part of the issue is, is not only the technology, but also the laws. Um, and, and so another indictment that's in the book buried in there is thinking about terrorism and counterterrorism and who counts as a terrorist and how there's a racialized aspect to that, that discourse that comes out of the West and has now been adapted by China. So I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. And again, if you are a, a registered participant in this webinar, you should feel free to use uh, the Q&A function to send us some questions. Um, there's several of the questions um, relate to um, uh, policy responses to to um, what's taking place in Xinjiang, um, policy responses in the United States, um, and uh, and and some of them asked specifically about um, about genocide. I, I had meant to to ask you about this myself. Um, you know, President Biden. Uh, during the summer before he was elected, um, described what was taking place in Xinjiang as a genocide shortly after the Trump administration, um, uh, you know, made that same uh, designation, which has now been adopted by the Biden administration. Um, throughout the book, um, you draw certain analogies, particularly in the sections where you are um, discussing the the dehuman dehumanizing aspects uh, of the detention camps. You draw analogies um, to uh, to the Holocaust. I don't think you use the word uh, genocide, and, and um, I, wa I wondered a bit about that, and uh, you know how how how, um, y how you see this designation working as. Um, uh, as a policy tool uh, for, well, just as, a, as an accurate description of what's happening on the one hand, and then also as a, as a tool for um, trying to organize um, uh, political action. Well, I'm not a legal expert or a policy expert per se. Um, I do have some opinions. Um, a lot of the thinking I'm doing in relation to the Holocaust or writing about the Holocaust is, you know, I draw on the work of Primo Levi and, you know, Hannah Arendt is in the back of my mind a lot as well, um, is, is really thinking about the mechanisms inside the camps, how dehumanizing work happens, um, how power relations are built um, by turning detainees against each other and guards um, enforcing rules in, in particular ways. Um, so, you know, camps in general do those sorts of things uh, because they're outside of legal frameworks. When it comes to genocide, um, you know, I think it does meet the definition, at least one of the definitions of genocide, which is, you know, having to do with the transfer of children from one ethnic group to another. Um, there does appear to be an, in an intent to destroy uh, a people or aspects of a people, uh, a people's way of life. Um, most people, when they think about genocide, think about mass killing, and we haven't seen evidence of mass killing or intentional killing. Um, there are certainly deaths in the camps and in the prisons, um, mostly, though, from neglect, from abuse, um, from torture, those sorts of things, not 
you know, lining people up and, and, and killing them on ma on mass. Um, so, you know, I think it would, it, it, there is some use value for sure in terms of, of political pressure and leverage when you have a genocide designation. I think crimes against humanity is, is, is certainly meets all criteria for that. Um, that's a little less workable probably when it comes to legal frameworks. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where I come down on this issue. The, the main, one of the main factors here is that China has a, is a very powerful actor in the world. And so building coalitions in opposition to it are, are very difficult. Um, and so that's really where I think the most work needs to be done is in that coalition building and, and, and really, you know, being resolved around this issue. I don't know if Jessica has thoughts on this or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm similarly, you know, not a lawyer or international criminal law expert, so I don't want to wade too deeply into um, some um, ill-informed opinion about what label is correct. I think for me, when I'm thinking about this, um, it's always it, so, so it's so clear that what is happening is horrific in in every aspect and needs and, and needs to be stopped. Right. So the question that I'm always asking myself is what is the term that like best um, accommodates that reality, right? What is the term that is going to get people to, to raise people's awareness, to get people activated, to think about this in, in, in a, in the most productive way. Um, and the problem, you know, the, with the world in general right now is how polarized uh, almost every conversation it feels like we have has become. Right. And so I'm, I, I think it's a useful uh, term if it gets people activated um, and and can, as Darren was saying, like help build international coalitions and do things like that. Um, you know, I am concerned that you know if if um, it, some people can take it as just being purely political and and use it kind of in the opposite way and and say, well, this is just the U.S. wanting to bludgeon China, uh, you know, because it's anti-China, and so. Um, those are, that's like, I, I, I'm, oh, I'm constantly like having this war with myself about those terms. Um, but I, for me, it really just comes down to, this is truly, truly horrific and whatever gets the job done, gets the job done. <laughs> Another audience member is asking, um, I think this one's for you, Darren, uh, how you assess the UN's response to, um, uh, the evidence of what is, has taken place in Xinjiang. Well, it's been slow. I think that's clear. Um, and part of that has to do with um, the previous U.S. administration's withdrawal from the U.N. Human Rights Council. Um, you know, although the U.N. has also really held them to the held held China to to task. Um, when it comes to certain commissions within the human rights, uh, the the um, the UN, uh, not not human rights, but having to do with uh, race and and other issues. So, it's I guess been a mixed response. But you know, the UN is is a body that has many voting members, and China is quite powerful at the UN, um, and so there's sort of a, a block of support that has formed around China's position mostly having to do, I think, with trade relations with China and maintaining good relations with China, um, less about the evidence uh, on the ground. Um, so, you know, there's more work to be done at the UN for sure. Um, and, you know, that's one space where there could be more coalition building. I have been encouraged with some of the the research that is is that is being done sort of behind the scenes at the UN that I've been involved with personally. Um, I think there are people there that are very concerned. Um, so yeah, we'll see how it plays out over time. Susie, you're muted. I am. Sorry about that. I'm just looking through some of these uh, great uh, questions from the audience, some of which I think are just asking um, for you to um, elaborate a bit more on some of the things that you've already said, Darren. But um, one question is asking you to go into a bit more detail about 
um, the official Chinese explanation for what's going on in Xinjiang, including how many people they claim are being interrogated and detained for what reasons and what the trend is in terms of the future of the camps. Um, I know you've talked about that a little bit, but maybe just give us a sense of um, you know where those statements have have been over the last in the last uh, year or so. Well, the, the the Chinese state has not given a number of officially of the people that are detained. They have agreed that there are um, education centers. Uh, those names have changed over time as well. Um, so so I can't give you the state you know, statistics because they haven't provided them. Um, what they have said, and this is in a document that they've given to the UN um, in response to, uh, and I'm blanking on the, the the commission that's within the UN that asked for this, it had to do with, with racial justice. Yeah, can, uh, commission on the elimination of racial discrimination. Right. Um, so in response to queries from that body, um, they gave a report um, that talked about the types of people that they detained. And they said very clearly that you know, people that have been sent to these centers are those whose terrorism and extremism crimes are not serious. That's one category. Another category are those who've, who have committed harmful crimes, terrorism and extremism crimes, um, but without malicious intent. And, and also they had the capacity um, to like, confess and ask for forgiveness. Um, the third group of people that were detained, they said, are, are people that were form, like, had been formally uh, sentenced as criminals in the past, um, or at least that's the indication I had, although it might have been also that those are being sentenced in the future. So they were getting their re-education before going to prison. But there's some connection with you know, having a formal prison sentence. Um, so, so those were the types of people they said they detained. Um, which accords with all of the documents I've seen. So in the intercept uh, data set that I've reviewed, um, I see, you know, between 10 to 20% of adults in of adult Muslims, Turkic Muslims for the most part, but Muslims in general, in particular neighborhoods in Rumchi being detained. Um, and, you know, in some places you see slightly higher numbers, you know, 20% of adults being detained. In other places, you see slightly lower numbers. Um, but in general, the sort of 10% to 15% of the adult Muslim population being detained um, seems pretty solid. Um, and this is based on empirical data, government data from particular case cases across the region. Um, it, you know, and, and so you can start there, but then when you start to talk to detainees about the people that have been detained in their situations um, and interviews with people from across the region, you know, you get the same numbers over and over again, or, you know, thereabouts, you know, 10 to 20%. So I, I would say that that's a safe estimate in terms of how many people have been detained and in most cases are still missing. You know, sometimes they've been sent to, to, to factories in other cases, though they've, they're just now in prison. We have, unsurprisingly, another few questions about international response, um, uh, including one about um, what kind of role the private sector has to play in addressing uh, what's taking place in Xinjiang. Does a large scale international boycotting help achieve liberation for the Uyghur people? Question, I think, is. Um, you know, a lot of people are also thinking about in the context of the upcoming Olympics. Sure. I'll go first this time, Baird. Um, I, I think that is absolutely one of the biggest pressure points that is available to the international community is the economic leverage, because I think um, what we've seen so far is that China has been quite happy to ignore um, strong representations of discontent from the U.S. and other countries. Um, not fully, because it has, as, as we've talked about, they have changed how, this look, how these look. They have shut down some of these camps. Um, but as we are also talking about, uh, you know, a lot of these people are still very unfree in, in important ways, and, and there's still a large number of people who are incarcerated in various forms. Um, but the place I think that there, that, that, 
carries a lot of potential at this point is moving it beyond government talking points um, and into the economic sector. Um, so I, I do think that cor international corporations do have a role to play in making sure their supply chains are clean uh, and making sure that they are not you know, directly or indirectly benefiting from forced labor um, or supporting the economy that is forcing, the, the, in which all these people are being forced to work. Yeah, I can add to that. Um, you know, one thing I should make clear is that, in case you don't know, Xinjiang is the source of around 85% of Chinese cotton, which is, you know, 20% plus of the world's supply. Um, it's also, you know, 20 plus percent of the world's tomatoes come from that region. Um, and most of the labor associated with the camps have to do with garment manufacturing or, you know, cotton apparel, those sorts of things. Um, in the in, in in the region and and mostly associated with the camps outside of the region, the the Uyghur labor is is in more low skilled sort of positions, um, and often they're in electronics um, or you know, electronics plays a, a larger role. Um, so you know it's in particular domains of of the global supply chain um, where camp labor or labor associated with the camp is being used. And you know whether or not it produces the liberation of the Uyghurs. Um, I think you know as consumers, as you know, people purchasing, you know, in bulk these goods. Um, I think there's a moral obligation, you know, to to not contribute to those kinds of labor conditions. Um, and I think that Jessica is absolutely right that that the economic cost is really, I think, what motivates the Chinese state to respond. Um, and I think the moral cost from the camps, um, which will translate into an economic cost is still just emergent really as more and more people understand what's happened and what is happening. Um, I think it's, it's been one of the worst marketing moves that China could have made, um, in terms of having people wanting to buy their products. Um, so I think that's, that is really the pressure point. Can't say that it will produce liberation, um, but it, I think, reduces harms. I wonder how, how the, just my own follow up on that question, but also relates to something from the audience. Um, I wonder how the work on um, identifying those supply chains accurately is going. I mean, I know it's, I know it's really difficult. I remember vividly that, um, in the late 1990s, when the Han Chinese uh, labor activist Liu Nianchun got out of a labor camp where he'd been for years, he landed in the United States at Kennedy Airport and the Christmas, like he looked at the Christmas lights that were decorating Kennedy Airport and said, oh, we made those in my, my prison. Um, so how is that, um, how, how advanced is that work of, um, of tracing where uh, where cotton comes from, where garments are being produced, how easy is it to do? What are the obstacles? Describe that a little bit. You first, Jessica. Okay, we're both too polite. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm also not an expert on like the cotton supply chain, but my understanding is that it's incredibly complicated. Um, what happens is that cotton gets mixed up. Uh, you don't necessarily have, you know, your one garment isn't all necessarily cotton from one place. Um, there's been some really interesting discussions about new technologies that allow you to do. I'm not going to say DNA testing because that's not right, but some sort of isotopic or some testing on the cotton, and you can tell actually where it was grown because it has a unique signature from, from where it was grown. Uh, and that would be one way of testing, even, even if you don't have visibility into your entire supply chain, right? Like there's a bunch of middlemen um, that you're going through, you would know ultimately if any of your cotton came from that, uh, from, from Xinjiang. So that's one new tool. I don't think that's in wide use. Um, and I think that there's still massive, massive problems. There's just, the, the supply chain is incredibly opaque. Um, it, cotton goes through so many different stages of processing in a bunch of different places. Uh, and so it's not like you can just even ask who you're buying from directly where they got it, because they may not know all the steps either. And then obviously there's the issue with, you know, you can go up and do all the inspections you want, but how do you know it's not a Potemkin sort of factory situation that you're walking into? 
And the other piece of that is that the state and local officials and, and, and company of you know leaders are actively trying to hide their use of Uyghur labor. Um, although it's sort of a mixed bag because initially they were really celebrating it as you know a way of them showing how they're embracing um, the aid Xinjiang, which is how a lot of this stuff is talked about. Um, those economic um, development uh, projects. So, you know, having Uyghur laborers or something that people are used to celebrate. And you can still find some of those, those uh, documents. Um, and so what I know that, you know, researchers that are looking at this are, are doing is they're archiving all of that um, as a first step, um, all of those available documents. And then they're working through um, corporate and uh, other forms, uh, other trade um, platforms where you can find some of the stuff being sent from place to place, you know, all the way down to the cotton bale, like, cause each bale has a, has a ID number. Um, so there, there is work being done. It's just, it's a lot of work and, you know, really there could be more funding and institutional support around that kind of work. Got a couple of questions, um, including one from our boss, Orville Schell, um, head of the Center on U.S.-China Relations, about the, hi Orville, um, about the bureaucratic uh, underpinnings of the detention camps. What, is there some, you know, which, which part of the government um, oversees them? And Orville's question is, how do they relate um, to the larger Lao Gai reform through labor um, a system of uh, prisons and other kinds of um, uh, detention facilities in China. Okay, well, I'll start. Jessica can can correct me and fill everything else in. Um, so it's it's a little bit complicated. I mean, because there's some opacities in terms of how they talk about these things and what evidence you can find. Um, but it's very clear that the Civil Affairs Ministry, which you know, really moves out of the shechu, which is what it's called in Chinese, um, is one of the uh, uh, bureaucratic sort of um, systems or, or um, organizations that, that assess people to decide if they're trustworthy or not, if they should be recommended for uh, detention. And they also um, go into the camps and monitor people from their neighborhoods to make sure that they're progressing and, you know, and then they monitor them when they come out as well. Um, so the civil affairs ministry, you know, those are civil servants. They're not police actually, um, but they work in very close uh, proximity to the police um, and the public security bureau um, and state security. They are, I think the, the, the main sort of organizational or bureaucratic uh, organs that, that run the camps as far as I can see from bid contracts and so on. There is, in some cases, I think, a, like a special commission sort of within the PSB um, that is in charge of camps. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of at the limit of my knowledge in terms of sort of the, the bureaucratic minutia. Um, in general, it's PSB, Public Security Bureau and Civil Affairs Ministry. Uh, I'll add the Ministry of Justice because they have... Um, uh, they're also the ones that technically are the, you know, the bureaucratic umbrella under which prisons are run. Um, and uh, some of the documents talk about them helping set up camps initially. Uh, whether, I, I, I think Darren's right, it's not, you know, Ministry of Just, Justice, civil, um, civil servants like in the camps necessarily, but it's underneath that umbrella as well. They have some sort of role um, in how this is all uh, being done. And I, Darren, I was so, I I. I learned so much from this book, but also I was like so depressed that I hadn't realized what a large role that the Ministry of Civil Affairs had and every single place in the book where it's mentioned, I have it circled 20 times. Um, and so I'm really just grateful for that, actually, that bit of information that you made so clear to the world. I think we have time for maybe just uh, one or two more questions. Um, we have a question about, um, about the response to reports of what's taking place in Xinjiang uh, on uh, what, what the audience member calls the global left, 
Um, and, and this person says it's disappointing to see here uh, genocide denial from some groups on the left. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. I know, Darren, you've been involved. Uh, you've been a signatory to several um, letters by um, left identifying scholars in response to, to some of the most um, uh, egregious uh, kind of denialism, but how do you understand why this is, uh, why this is happening? I, I don't understand it, to be honest. Um, I think there is a reflex probably on the left to identify with China as a socialist state, which it's not really, but I think, you know, because the communist party is still in charge, um, they see it as sort of in the camp of people that they want to be uh, allied with. And so people will bend over backwards to believe disinformation about this, um, the conditions on the ground. Um, and you know, there is a history with leftists taking the wrong side on things like this. You know, when when it came to you know, the genocide in Cambodia, you know, leftists at least initially said, "Oh, this can't be true." Um, and you know, there were leftists that supported, um, you yeah, know the cultural revolution and other, and other things. So I think this, this moment is similar in some ways. Um, I think they, the, the, the rivalry between the U S and China uh, figures in this pretty uh, strongly. And they feel like, um, you know, Western media um, and scholars like myself are, are really propping up the U.S. state in some way by, you know, looking at the empirical reality that people live in in, in Xinjiang. Um, and so I think they, they feel like it's damaging to China to talk about these things. And so the only reason we could want to do that is because, you know, we have um, a position in opposition to China. Um, you know, that's not the case necessarily at all. Um, there may be some that have written about this that, that do feel in those ways. They're anti-China. Um, but, you know, this is a human rights crisis. It's a, it's a labor rights crisis. Um, it's a technology crisis. It's a human crisis. And, you know, anyone of conscience should be willing to stand up in opposition to it. Um, so that's the stance that I've taken. All right, I've got one more, I think, uh, question that maybe would allow you to end on a, on a slightly hopeful note. We'll see. Um, but uh, the question is about how Chinese, what would it look like for Chinese society to recover from what is happening in Xinjiang? Um, you know, if, if China were to take a more um, liberal uh, turn, the, the questioner asks, how, how could it explain this to the rest of the Han population? Um, you know, what, what kinds of resentment that these policies have generated among Uyghurs? Well, you know, what is, what might that look like? Um, is there, is there a way that you could envision any of this ending uh, a little less appallingly? Well, you know, there's no easy solutions to this. And, you know, a scholar I was talking to recently said it's, you know, sometimes you just have to sit in despair. Um, and you know, that's useful too, to just, you know, dwell on the moment and not think about solutions all, all, all the time to, to really just sit with the pain and the suffering and see it for what it is. That's important. Um, and I think if you know, Han people doing that is also really crucial, you know, coming to the truth of what's what's been done in their name. And, you know, there are some people that are beginning to do that, you know, have done that. Um, that's, I think, how you start to get to some form of reconciliation. Um, but, you know, recovering from these sorts of situations takes a very long time, generations really, and it takes a lot of active work. Um, and so, you know, truth and reconciliation will be something that, you know, when it comes, will play out over a long period of time. I don't have a an easy solution to this problem, um, but I am heartened to see Han people, you know, feeling a sense of obligation to to, to take a position and, and and to speak 
to their friends, to their social network about what, what they know to be true, what they've seen themselves, um, you know, those sorts of things. Is there a plan to translate your book into, into Chinese? Is that happening? I don't know if that's happening. There's some discussion about translating it into Italian and into Thai. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it may come at some point. Uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, it's, it's still new to the world. So we'll see what life it takes. Well, I really hope that happens. It's a really uh, incredible book. And we um, feel so grateful that you that we were able to host its launch and to have a chance to talk about it with you again. Again, uh, the book is In the Camps. I've got my galley copy here. Um, and it is uh, available through Columbia University Press uh, and elsewhere. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to you, Jessica and uh, Darren. Uh, thank you. And we will talk to you soon. Good night. Thank you.